Welcome to lecture 18. And today we move finally beyond scalar field theories. And we'll talk about a the quantization of a fermionic field. Right? So this is, uh, you can find this in many books. I have listed all the references here. Some of them are doing canonical quantization. Some of them are doing path integrals. In fact, Peskin does both. So this first uh, set of uh, sections here do the canonical one and, and, and the other one do, does it to path integrals. So before we start with the quanti quantization of uh, the fermionic field, let's just remind ourselves of a few ideas of what is those, what are those fields that we're calling fermionic fields. For now, it's just a name, but I'll show that they have Fermi statistics, right? Eventually. Uh, so the idea is that there is a, a, a type, there is one of the representations of the Poincaré group which transforms under these operators. So this is a, 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 some representation of the, the Poincaré group, of the Lorentz group, uh, for a particular Lorentz transformation. So lambda here is a Lorentz transformation. And these objects are constructed in terms of these generators, S mu nu here, which are defined in this way, right? These are four by four matrices. These gamma matrices here are called the, are called the Dirac matrices. There are four by four objects. So there are two hidden indexes here. When I indicate those indexes, I usually use I, J, right? But you have to be careful not to confuse those with the spatial part of, of the Lorentz index, right? And they also, beside these two hidden indexes here, they also have one Lorentz index. And these guys are defined by the Clifford algebra, right? So these uh, brackets here mean anti-commutators. So I use uh, these brackets for commutators and these ones for anti-commutators. And this is the metric of my space, right? So this is general. Of course, the form, the specific form for the Dirac matrices will depend on my convention for the metric, right? And even then, even for a particular convention, I still have some freedom of choice here. So I have to be careful about what exact representation of the Dirac matrices is being used when you compare different references. And I, I, in fact, you have shown in an exercise back in lecture one or two, right, that these uh, generators satisfy the Lorentz algebra. So this is, in fact, a representation of the Lorentz transformations. And the guys that transform under these transformations will be my fermionic fields. So now I'm, I'm concerned in, in writing a general uh, Lorentz invariant uh, Lagrangian for these guys and quantizing it and see what kind of result I get, right? So this is, is as I said, uh, good for any uh, metric and any number of dimensions, in fact, right? And in particular, just to give us uh, some intuition of what's going on here, let's take one particular example. Think of a three-dimensional space Forget time. I just have three uh, coordinates, right? And this is just Euclidean 3D space without time, right? In that case, one one particular representation for the Pauli matrix, for the Dirac matrices I could choose, is exactly the Pauli matrices, right? Defined in this way. Let me just write them real quick because I want to define our conventions here. So sigma 2, this is sigma 2, not sigma square, minus i, i, 0, and sigma 3 is 1, 0, 0, minus 1, right? And because uh, I know that of this property, that sigma i times sigma j is equal to delta i j plus i epsilon i j k sigma k right i can easily prove that the anti-commutator of gamma i gamma j 
which is sigma i sigma j, right? And i and j go from one to three because I'm talking only of 3D space, right? Is sigma i sigma j plus sigma j sigma i, which then I can use this, uh, this identity here, right? And write this as two delta i j plus i epsilon i j k sigma k plus i epsilon j i k sigma k because i and j are exchanged on the second term here, right? And this is totally anti-symmetric, right? So this inversion of i and j changes the sign, this goes away, and this is just two delta i j which is the metric of 3D Euclidean space, right? Just one, just one, 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 right? Which proves that these guys satisfy the Clifford algebra for a three-dimensional space, Euclidean. Right? So this is a good choice for the Dirac matrices in 3D, right? And, uh, and then I can write, right, as ij as i over 4 gamma i gamma j as defined above, right? This is the definition of S mu mu, right? In this case, just S i j. And you can just use the commutator of Pauli matrices here and rewrite this as half of epsilon i j k sigma k. Since I'm Euclidean space, doesn't matter if I'm up or down with these indexes, right? Uh, and you will recognize from quantum mechanics that this is how you rotate spin half particles in 3D, right? I'm just talking about 3D rotations. That's what this, this group is in 3D, right? Since I don't have the boost, I'm taking just the 3 by 3 part of the Lorentz transformation, which is uh, rotations in 3D, in 3D right? And this is how I spin half rotates, right? You have to go around twice too. So we know, we know, uh, we know this object, right? If you take the z direction, it's pretty easy to remember that you have to rotate twice to get to the same state. It's, it's the usual spin half rotation of, of you, you might have seen in quantum mechanics, right? So that's important because it shows what kind of, uh, object we're dealing with, right? I'm saying this will be fermionic fields, and already you see that at least the three by three part of these transformations works like rotations of spin half particles. And hopefully the bigger uh, Lorentz transformation that includes the boosts too, will behave as boosts of spin half particles. We'll see that down the line. Right? But already we have some indication here of what kind of uh, thing we're dealing with. Right? Of course, uh, most of the properties, most of what I'll do next, depends on actually choosing. Uh, this is not the only representation in 3D, but uh, in 4D I have even more freedom. right? And I have to choose a, a representation. The one we are going to use will be this one where I choose gamma zero, the zero component, the time component of the Dirac matrix is like this, right? And it is understood, this is a four by four matrix. So these ones here, let me, I will not carry this all the time, but since you're probably not used to it, it's important to remember that these zeros are two by two matrices of zeros, and these are two by two identities, right? And the same for gamma i, which will have, again, two by two mat zero matrices and Pauli matrices here. So I can define these guys in terms of the Pauli matrices. And this representation has a name. This one is called the Cairo. or the vial representation.
right? The Cairo or the VIO representation. The Cairo uh, part of it, we will understand why this is called the Cairo representation. Uh, so in this particular choice, right, then uh, gamma zero dagger is gamma zero, right? Obviously, just look at this, right? And gamma i dagger is minus gamma i because of this sign, right? So if I take the dagger, yeah, you have to put all the Pauli matrices here and, and take a look, but it's easy to see that this is true. But this is uh, this is already particular to these representations and a few others, but it's important to differentiate this property from, from, for instance, the Clifford algebra, which is true always, right, for any Dirac matrix. Particular another property that you can take straight from here, which will be very important, is this one, right? We will use that all the time. And you can easily show, using these relations, you can show these pretty quickly. Right? So you use these all the time because it's it won't be it will be very common for us to have to commute gamma zero with this and using this property I can show that putting a gamma zero to the side removes the dagger and we'll be using that a lot so keep that property in mind right? and I can actually use a, a, a more compact notation for this representation by defining uh, this object is like a four poly, a four component uh, poly matrix, poly matrix, right? Which is composed just by a, the two by two identity. Every time I write one or zero, try to figure out what size of zero and what size of identity I'm talking about. In this case, it's two by two because the other components are poly matrices, right? And I can also define the sigma mu bar, right? which is just one, and I, I invert the sign of the, the space part. And in, in, using those definitions, I can write gamma mu in a more compact form, which is just this, right? Easily, you can easily see that I can go from here to there, right? And again, this is the vial or Cairo representation hmm? now you have to of course just writing it like that doesn't even tell you these are proper uh, Dirac matrices so you can you have to show that using those definitions you can show that gamma mu gamma mu is equal to 2 G mu mu right times the identity the 4 by 4 identity in these these internal indexes of the Dirac matrices, right? These uh, four by four indexes here, where and this is important, G min U is right the diagonal of one minus one minus one minus one, right? So this is the the diagonal. Of course, if I choose another uh, G min U, I have to adapt uh, the Cairo representation will be different in another uh, uh, another choice for the metric, right? The important part, part of the Cairo representation is seen when I define the fifth uh, Dirac matrix, matrix, which is defined by, in this representation, gamma 0, gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3, right? which is an important one that uh, we use a lot. And in what we call the vial representation is the representation. And if you take all the definitions and make this product, you can easily show that this guy is just minus one, one, zero, zero. So what we normally call the vial or chiral representation is the representation where this guy is diagonal. Right? So that's the important thing. And we'll see pretty soon why this gamma 5 is useful for us. For now, it's not part of the Clifford algebra, so it's, it's just uh, a matrix that I, I define, right? And I'll show why it's important. But the file representation is defined by this guy being diagonal, 
be careful because a lot of books actually make gamma zero diagonal and then gamma five will not be diagonal. This is another representation. We we'll use it now and then, but mostly we'll use this one. Now S menu is a more complicated object that supposedly also contain the, contains the boosts. But look what, what happens if I look only at the, the 3 by 3 uh, uh, special part of, of S, I, J, even in this representation, right? Which will, again, be defined always in the same way. And I put this definition in, right? This will be just I over 4. I over 4 minus the commutator of sigma i sigma j 0 0 minus the commutator of sigma i sigma j which means that the whole thing is just half of epsilon i j k sigma k 0 0 sigma k remember this is a 4 by 4 matrix but again i have something that looks a lot like a rotation of spin half states right like i had here in fact exactly the same thing it's just half of epsilon i j k sigma k that means that when i act with this object on a four component state Suppose I have now a four component state and I act with this guy. These two components on the top and these two components on the bottom will rotate like spin half states. Like I have a spin half state rotating here and a spin half state rotating on the bottom, right? which is an indication of the kind of object in which we will act with this operator right we'll, we'll get our representation of of these uh, rotations and that will behave like like this right you have basically a, two copies of the spin half rotation of course boosts will be more complicated right but the rotation really looks like just a rotation of a spin half object okay? so the next step will be to define uh, Lorentz, Lorentz uh, scalars built out of the fields that transform under this uh, representation, right? This size that I define at the top here. So now I want to build Lorentz invariants based on these guys, right? Sadly, the very first thing that would come to mind is not Lorentz invariant, as you have shown in one of the exercises, right? If I take this object and make a Lorentz transformation, right? By definition, this guy goes into this dagger, right? This is the transformation of the guy on the left. The guy on the right is uh, simply this, right? That's how I define these fermionic states. But M is not unitary because some elements in Sij are not Hermitian, the boosts specifically are not Hermitian. So this is different from Psi dagger Psi. Hmm? So the, the most obvious object is, is not Lorentz invariant. Right? Gladly for us, it's not, dif it's not that difficult to obtain a Lorentz invariant object. All I have to do is define Psi bar, which in this representation, this is important, right? This will be different for a different uh, representation of the Dirac matrices. So in some books you see this defined like this, in other books that depends a lot on the convention of the metric and which representation you use. But in this case, Psi bar is just this object. So this is a definition. Right? I'm defining this guy right here. And with this guy, it's easier to define uh, Lorentz invariant because uh, psi, psi bar psi, which is psi dagger, gamma zero psi, 
goes under Lorentz boosts into psi dagger m d dagger of lambda gamma zero m d of lambda psi and um, this I think you have shown in an exercise is the same as m minus 1 of lambda right if you didn't do this exercise this is proven in page 43 of Peskin's right I'm, I won't go to the trouble here this is the kind of thing that you see normally on a classical field theory course when you see Dirac equation solved properly right but the important point is that when I go through with the gamma zero here, I get m minus one, and then I just get psi dagger gamma zero psi, right? which is psi bar psi. So this is Lorentz invariant. So the, that's the proper object I want to write my Lagrangian. Another thing we can prove is very useful is that psi bar, we won't use it right now, but down the line that will be very useful, uh, actually transform under Lorentz boosts as a Lorentz uh, vector. So if I do a Lorentz boost, this goes into this one, which means that if I build, uh, say, a vector, Lorentz vector V mu, right, that also transforms like this, this object will be uh, uh, Lorentz invariant, right? All I have to do is, because this transforms as a vector, these two, so the total object is Lorentz invariant. And this is very useful for us. So we could build, uh, easily build a higher invariant, so any power of this will be invariant too any uh, contraction, right? I could also do, do this, right? Just sticking to fermionic fields. I could write objects like this or even bigger combinations, right? So this uh, to any power is also a Lorentz invariant. But I'll focus for now on the Gaussian part of the theory because we want to solve for the free theory first and then we'll go to interactions and see which interactions are interesting for us or not. So sticking to the Gaussian part, right? The, the, the two invariants I can build essentially are this one, right? Which is already there. And something like the vector times this. But since I have no other fields in my theory, the only vector I can, I can write is, re is really the derivatives, right? I can contract derivatives. This derivative is acting on someone here, right? So an object like this could be, I could, I could write something like this, right? So, but this is a total derivative. Usually I'm not interested in surface terms because they, they go to infinity. So uh, I'll write my Lagrangian in this way. And everything else is convention, right? I'm also uh, trying to get uh, my my Lagrangian to be uh, uh, Hermitian. That's why I have this I here. Also, you notice that I have this derivative acting only on this guy, right? And the most general thing would be also to write it acting on that guy. But that is redundant because, as I said, these two terms uh, differ only uh, by that total derivative, right? which is I, I can disregard because it's just a surface term. So uh, that's important. In fact, to show that this is Hermitian, you have to take the Hermitian conjugate and then uh, change the derivative from one guy to another, which will get you an extra sign. Uh, and that's how you show this is Hermitian, and that's why I have 
this i there. So that's the action we work with, which is uh, the most general thing, including only Gaussian terms, right? It's free theory, right? I'm, I'm looking at the free theory. And again, the same caveats as we had for a scalar field, right? This is already written as a mass here. I could guess this just by dimensional analysis. But again, the most general thing would be to put just some co some unknown number here. And later, when we look at the spectra of the theory, we could try to identify this as a mass. Right? We frequently use the following notation. Let me define a thing here, which is the slash notation. So in this case, I can define del slash, the derivative slash, which is just this. Right? We use this a lot, especially for momenta. Since we have these Dirac matrices walking around, uh, we frequently define objects which are the slash objects. So P slash means gamma mu, P mu, right? And it is important to remember that when you see a slash like that, there's a Dirac matrix, uh, Dirac matrix hidden in there. So there is, this is a matrix, right? This is a four by four uh, matrix. If I take this uh, action and use uh, Euler-Lagrange, right? I can just, I, I, again, I'm doing the same we did for the complex scalar field. Remember that this spinor is a complex uh, uh, number, actually a four component complex number. So, um, uh, I have to treat Psi and Psi star or Psi bar, Psi dagger as independent objects from Psi, right? They, they need to be independent to each other. So I can do Euler-Lagrange varying this guy, right? And get the equation to Psi bar or the other way around. I can vary. Then I need first to throw the derivative to this side. Right, and do that, or I can vary it in, in relation to cyber and get the Dirac equation. Right, so these are the fields that satisfy the Dirac equation. Remember, there's a free index here, right? And so that that is an uh, uh, equation that is satisfied for each of the components of Psi. So uh, that makes clear that I'm solving now, trying to quantize the field that satisfies the equation. This is not a wave function. Forget relativistic quantum mechanics, right? We are in field theory now. Right? So this is the field that satisfies the equation. Now let's take a look at how these uh, representations are really working in, in the representation for the Dirac matrices that I, I choose, right? So we, are, we have already seen that the 3D rotations, right, in, in space are assuming this form uh, in the VIO representation, right? So it's just a block diagonal thing with Pauli matrices here which shows me these guys rotate like uh, spin half states. Now let's take a look at the boosts, right? So the boosts are the time space part of this SIJ matrix, matrix the anti-symmetric part, right? And if I, I take all the, the Dirac matrices and, and, and put them together here, uh, in my representation, the boosts come out like this, right? which is also block diagonal. In fact, that's the beauty of the, the VIO representation for the Dirac matrices. Because when you look at something like that, uh, it is pretty obvious right, that you're talking about a, a reducible representation. Because if I, of course, these guys will act on a four component object, the spinner, right? But, but it, it should be clear that there is a smaller division here, which is this one. Let's take let just this two component object and this, this second two component object. 
which are smaller representations of the same group because this guy transforms complete in a completely independent way from this guy. They are never mixed by rotation nor by boosts, right? And they transform differently. So they have the same transformation under rotations, but different transformations under boosts. You see, there's a, a sign different difference uh, uh, in the way this guy transforms under boosts from this guy. So these are two different representations of the same group, right? So what, what we are seeing here is that I can build this representation, which is a four by one object. Let me indicate this, this is a four component object. But this four component object can be divided into two smaller two component objects, which for now I'll indicate like that. Eventually I'll suppress these, uh, these uh, labels in yellow here, right? Because they will become redundant. This representation, which is reducible, because it can be reduced to these two smaller ones, is called the Dirac spinner. So let me put a name here. And these two representations, each of them is called a vial spinner, which are these two by one uh, objects, these smaller and the real. In fact, they, these are the, the true irreducible representations of the, the Lorentz uh, group. I will soon come back to the question of when do we want to use Dirac spinners or when do you want to use vial spinners? Of course, that depends on the physics we want to describe, but uh, even when we want to use vial spinners, the tool set that we'll develop to work with uh, Dirac matrices is so powerful that even when we want to deal with vial spinners, we we'll want to, to also embed them in four component objects, right? That transform just like Dirac uh, spinners. Because then we can we will be dealing with algebras of of um, Dirac matrices, right? And the, the the way we do that is like a little bit confusing because most books uh, abuse the notation a little bit. But we'll define a four component object, right? That is just this. So I put this guy on the first two uh, components and zero zero. Right? It should be clear that this, even being a four component object, transforms exactly like this two component object. Because if I act either with rotations or boosts on this object, I'll be only acting on the first two components. The rest is just zero. Right? And the same way we can define this four component right handed um, vial spinner just putting zero on the first two components and then the two component right-handed vial spinner at the bottom, right? Which will transform with the appropriate signs for, for appropriate sign for boosts, right? So uh, for now, I'm just calling these vial spinners left-handed and right-handed. We'll see uh, down the line how this is connected with chirality which is what left-handed and right-handed means but for now it's just labels the, for now what i'm saying is just how they transform under boosts differently right and, and by defining these four component objects then i have this relation which is that the four component uh, direct spinner can be written just as a simple, a simple sum right, of the two component, the four component vial spinners. Right? Of course, we'll drop all these yellow labels here, but it should be in most in most cases, it should be obvious if you're talking about the four component one or the two component one, just by looking at the matrices 
that are acting on it. So there, you have Dirac matrices acting on the four component ones and Pauli matrices, right? These are Pauli matrices acting on the two component ones. So most, in, mo in most cases, it's obvious which one is it to just keep that difference in mind because we'll not be carrying this notation all the time. Right? Also, we can now define projector since the Dirac spinner is the sum of this uh, chirality, this vial spinners, right? I, I can actually project the, the Dirac spinner on its left-handed component or its right-handed component. And I do that by using the gamma 5 that I defined before, right? So gamma 5 is just minus 1, 0, 0, 1, right? And I can define two projectors, the left-handed projector, which is just 1 minus gamma 5 over 2, which is just 1. This is that 4 by, by 4, the 4 by 4 identity, right? And so this is the 2 by 2 identity. And the right-handed one will be 1 plus gamma 5 which is just this. And it should be clear that acting with those, here I select only the left-handed part or the right-handed part. All right, let me just color things accordingly. These are definitions. Okay. And in this way, I, I can uh, easily rewrite right, this equation just as PL psi D plus PR psi D so that psi L is just PL psi D and psi R is just this. They are just the projections. And you can easily prove a lot of uh, relations that show that these two guys are actually projectors, right? So for instance, PL square is PL PR square is PR. If you try to project one into the other, you get zero. So this is zero. Let's multiply these matrices and you see, right? Same as this. Right? And of course, PL plus PR are one, right? Again, because I'm taking all possible projections. You can see that from this equation, right? So. If I put psi D in evidence here, PL and PR should be the identity, and you can see that straight out from the matrices. So these are all properties which I demand from PL and PR. In this case, they are obvious, but in order, this should be true in any representation, even in a representation where gamma 5 is not diagonal. Again, the vial representation is very useful uh, for for this chirality discussion because uh, I mean everything becomes very very easy. Right? So we already found two representations, the direct representation and the vial one. And uh, I also have shown how to embed the vial representations in four component objects. But there is one more representation, right? And this one it's called the Majorana representation. Let me write here, my Yorana representation. And, and, and it is defined by what we call the reality condition, which is that Psi is equal to some, something that we call Psi C, right? Let me put this on a box. This is the reality um, condition. And Psi C is defined, Psi C is defined as minus I gamma 2 Psi star, right? Which then by this condition should be equal to Psi. The first thing you notice is that on this representation that I'm inventing right now, I'm forcing a relation between Psi and Psi star, right? So now they are not independent. So 
I'm making the, the, the number of degrees of freedom, I'm dividing the number of degrees of freedom by half, right? So I, I have half as many degrees of freedom in my theory now. To understand why this is happening and why do I want to impose that, we could also mention that further ahead, we'll define a transformation, which is called the charge conjugation transformation, which transforms all my particle in antiparticles. Anti so it exchange particles by antiparticles in my theory. We'll discuss these discrete symmetries uh, in a future video. Right? And we'll see that if this transformation is a symmetry or not of our Lagrangians. But for now, it suffices to know, right? I'll, I'll show this later, that the effect that this charge conjugation has on, on a spinor right, is to exchange the spinor by minus i gamma 2 psi star, which is exactly this psi c here. So, this charge conjugation exchanges psi by psi c. So this is the charge conjugate to psi. By demanding that the charge conjugate is the same as, as the field, right? what I'm saying is that the particles and antiparticles in my theory are the same. Right? So that's what I'm doing in the Majorana representation. I'm demanding that psi and, and, and psi c are the same. Right? Particles and the particles are the are their own antiparticle, right? And and now you see there's an analogy between what we're doing here and what we did in the scalar field. Because in the scalar field we started with a real scalar field, there was no charge, right? And it was its own antiparticle. We, we we discussed that before. When we went to the complex scalar field, there was a global symmetry, a conserved charge, and by being complex, this guy had two degrees of freedom, which allowed for particles and antiparticles, which had opposite charges of this global conserved uh, current, right? So, this is the closest you get to the real scalar field in the spinor case. These are still complex fields. These are still uh, complex valued fields, but since I'm forcing a relation between psi and psi star, they are not uh, independent anymore. That means my particles are the same as my antiparticles, especially in the way I'm doing, which I'm exactly forcing that. So already you see that uh, Majorana uh, representation uh, will be good when I want to de describe uh, fermions that don't have charges, right? That there's no global symmetry. Uh, no conserved charge, so it can be its own antiparticle, right? We'll discuss that further down, right? Uh, 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 you can show, right, and this is actually shown in, in Schwartz's book, right, that you can also embed, in principle, these guys can be, I can write my Orana uh, particles just as two components, so I can take one or any of these vial spinners and impose the reality condition on them right but what i'm doing here you can see i'm doing that to a four component object you see because i'm acting with gamma here right a direct matrix here and that's because i can also embed these uh majorana fermions in the four component object and that's what i do that's the useful thing to do and I do it in this way. So what is shown in shorts is that this object written like this. So now this is just a two component bio spinner. Again, the same one, see psi L, psi L. So I only have one left handed particle. I could do these with the right handed, just with small changes here. But just having one of these guys, right? Just one two component degree of freedom, I can write this four-dimensional object that satisfies the reality condition. That's what is shown on shorts, page 192, right? And, and, uh, and um, this object also transformed like a, um, like a Dirac spinner because sigma 2 
Psi L star transform under boosts like a right-handed object, right? So this is a right-handed object down here. Uh, just one uh, comment I want to make here to avoid confusion. You see that some books, Pesky especially, keep this charge conjugation as a gen as an abstract transformation, like I did here, right? I'm not really saying, uh, defining a representation for this transformation, just saying that under this transformation, this goes to that. This is like Schwartz does. Uh, Pesky indicates that in this way, right? Just says that C, Psi C, but this is a very abstract. I'm just saying this, there is some operator that acts on Psi, and since Psi is an operator too, it, it must act, be acted upon from both sides, right? And this is the same, this is minus I gamma 2 Psi star, right? So, it uses this, this uh, notation. Some other references, and in particular Nastasi's book, and also Lahiri uh, and Paul book, which actually does this in, with very good detail if you want, if you get interested in looking, actually define Psi C as the action of a matrix C, and now C is really a matrix, right? Uh, uh, and some other matrix in which can be gamma zero, for instance, acting on Psi star, right? And then C is written in terms of uh, direct matrices. For instance, for our uh, conventions, the appropriate one would be this, right? But this is obviously not the same C as this one because I cannot, this is a four by four matrix, right? I cannot multiply a four by four matrix on both sides of a four by one object, right? So this is an abstract. Right? So, for instance, Schwartz keeps this notation, never really writes any, not even this, right? just uh, abstract action. So, this is just both ways are good ways of implementing the charge conjugation, but be careful not to confuse the two because the C here is not the same C that goes in Peskin's uh, notation. Right? So, be careful with that. Now, I want to to close this uh, representation discussion, I want to uh, just discuss when should I use one representation or another, right? And, and, and the point is, let's go back to uh, our um, action. So I wrote a Lagrangian de density for Psi, the four component version of it, right? Which can be any of those now. Right? Because I can embed any of these other representation under the four component direct spinner. Right? I wrote this. That's another advantage of having these guys embedded on a four component object. I know that this is the action for all of them. Right? I can later just divide them in these subcomponents. But since all of these embeddings have the same transformation properties, uh, this is the invariant object that I get anyway. Right? And the point here is that, let's discuss first Vio and, uh, and versus Dirac representation. So what I want to do is use this relation and separate the Dirac spinner into its Vio components. Right? So I can rewrite this guy as psi bar L plus psi bar right, left and right, same thing in the middle, and psi L plus psi R. So far so good. Now I have four terms here that I have to take a look, and, and also actually eight terms because there's some terms that have these gamma matrix in the middle, and some terms that don't have anything. This is really the identity in this 4x4 four four space of Dirac spinner, right? The mass is just a number. Right? So let's take a look first at the mass, right? Since the mass does nothing, I'll have a product be directly between those guys. 
And the important thing I want you to notice here is that if I calculate psi bar, bar L, psi, psi L, right? This is, let's write it like this, PL psi dagger, right? This is psi L dagger, right? This is just psi L dagger. Times gamma zero, this is psi bar, times PL psi. Right? So far, so good. I can take the dagger there. This will be psi dagger. PL dagger, gamma zero, PL psi. And now I can use a bunch of properties here. The first one is that gamma five is Hermitian. Right? Gamma 5 dagger is just gamma 5. Right? And that means that if I take the dagger of PL or PR, the identity is all obviously does not change. And if I take dagger here, they are the same. In fact, you can just look here. So PL dagger is just PL and PR dagger is just PR. Another important uh, property is that gamma 5 was defined, actually, that's the way you define gamma 5 in general, right? As the matrix that anti-commutes with all the other Dirac matrices. Right? In this case, it commutes with every matrix from my uh, Clifford algebra, right? And this is a property gamma 5 has, the gamma 5 I define here has, right? And you can check it directly. But that's the definition of gamma 5. That's how you you really define gamma 5, and that's why in some other number of dimensions, if I have more different Clifford algebras, there are some dimensions in which you can find no matrix that commutes with all the Clifford algebra matrices. But in four dimensions, that's fine. Right? And, and that means that if I take PL gamma mu, doesn't matter which mu is this, when I try to commute gamma mu with this, it of course commutes with the identity, but it anti-commutes with gamma 5. So this sign changes, which means that this is true. When I pass gamma mu to a PR or a PL, it becomes the other option, right? The same if I put an R here, I'll get an L there because I'm changing this sign because of the anti-commutation. So I use these two properties that these guys are Hermitian and, 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 and that uh, I can just pass PL, PR, PL and PR by gamma direct matrices and that just change the chirality. So the first thing, I can get rid of this dagger and then when this goes over, I have Psi dagger gamma zero, PR, right, this guy becomes an R, PL, Psi. And this, I'm, every time I try to make a product of this orthogonal projections, this is zero. So Psi bar L, Psi L is just zero. So there is at least one product here that is zero. This is obviously also true if I just exchange L by R here. And then when I go over, this becomes an L and an R, right? It's also zero. So Psi bar R, Psi R, R zero. Right? So at least half of the terms that I would get proportional to the mass are zero. But the discussion changes completely if I have a gamma mu in the middle, because now I'll have a gamma mu in here, right? Which means using the same logic that at this point I'll have an extra gamma mu right here. 
which means that this PL now goes through gamma di uh, matrices, uh, Dirac matrices, twice. Right? So it changes to PR, PL again. And then you get PL square here, which since this is a projector, is just PL. Right? So this is not zero. This is not zero. But this guy, which will become, let's put an R here, which will become gamma zero, gamma mu, PL, PR, psi, E zero. So the, now is the cross term LR, which becomes zero. Right? So I can do this for all the combinations and see that in this case, in the case of the mass, the LLRR combinations are zero, but the LRRL are not. And in this case, with the gamma mu in the middle, the LL and RR combinations are zero, but the LR and RL are not, right? Which allow me, which allows me to write finally this expression sidebar L gamma mu del mu psi L um, plus the same thing with the right handed components plus minus the mass psi bar L psi R minus M psi bar R psi L. And this is the important uh, expression because now look, look at this expression. If I want to describe a massive fermion, a fermion that actually has a mass Right? I have to include in my theory both chiralities because the mass terms are multiplying this product between the left-handed and the right-handed vial representation. So the direct representation is this uh, direct sum of these two representations, right? which I need in order to describe mass. In, 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 in for fermion, right? Otherwise, I, if I only have psi L or if I only have psi R, I, I cannot put the mass term. On the flip side, if the mass is zero, then I don't have those terms. I don't have these. My, my, my action just becomes this one if the mass is zero, right? Which means that the, the left-handed vial component and the right-handed vial component are completely independent, right? This is an action for one field that does not even interact with the other one. And then vial spinners can be used to describe only mass, massless particles if you're only using vial spinners, right? It, the moment you want to describe a massive fermion, you have to mix those two vial components and, and, and get uh, a Dirac spinner. The one exception to this is the Majorana particles, right? Because look what happens with the Majorana particles, right? The moment I embed, right? So that part is clear. Before I go to the Majorana mass, that part is clear, but we know that these guys have conserved charges. They have particles and antiparticles that are not the same. So there is some symmetry here. We can show later that there is some kind of U1 symmetry that I can put here because these are complex numbers and there will be a conserved charge here. Suppose I want to describe a fermion with no conserved charge, right? Then I can go to Majorana representation if there is no charge because then the guy can be its own antiparticle and then there is the possibility for a mass because look, if I write Again, using the same example, I'm just embedding the Majorana particle in a 
four component object. These are two by two uh, components and I'm in, in enforcing the reality condition when I write it like that. Right? In this case, I have only the left-handed degree of freedom, right? And I have this complicated uh, uh, object that transforms at a right, as a right-handed, but uh, is not independent from the first one, right? It's the same degree of freedom. In this case, I can write a mass, which is usually the normalization, put a factor two here, for the same reasons that in the scalar field theory, I had a factor two in the complex, I didn't, right? And if I use this expression, I can rewrite this as this uh, mass term as psi L dagger sigma two psi L star plus the Hermitian conjugate of this. See, now I'm describing a, a theory that has mass terms, so terms that are uh, quadratic in the field, right? Without the derivatives, just quadratic in the field. There's a matrix in the middle, but that changes nothing. But only have one degree of freedom, which is left-handed. I could do the same for the right-handed. Right? So the Majorana uh, representation can be left-handed or right-handed. And I can get a mess. But the price I pay for that is that I can only write Majorana mass terms for particles that have no charges. Because otherwise, the reality condition is not good. Right? So there is also this possibility. So I can get mass for Dirac particles but those have charges or mass for Majorana particles, but those don't have charges. Okay. So let me put this all in a table just to make it clear. In summary, right, you could stay with the Dirac representation, which contains both components, both the left-handed and the right-handed component, which actually mix dynamically through the equations of motion, right, because both are mixed in the the um, the action so you get coupled uh, equations of motions for these guys right and this is what the embedding looks like for a four component thing which is the Dirac spinner and these can describe both massless or massive particles i can always do the same description with the mass equals zero right uh, the vial uh, representation no can have only the left-handed or the right-handed object, right, component. In here I show how I embed the left-handed component in a four-component object, but I could do the same for the right-handed down here, right? And they have this property, right? They are uh, eigenstates of the gamma-5 matrix, right? Eigenvectors of the gamma-5 uh, matrix. And this can only describe massless particles. Of course, you can then go, if these guys have no charges, if you're describing a, a left-handed or a right-handed particle that has no charges, then you can go to the Majorana representation, which again can have only the left-handed or the right-handed, right, independently. You can put both, but they will be independent, right? And then you can also build a four-component uh, object from these, one of these two. Again, I did for the left-handed, but you could do for the right-handed. Right? And then there is this condition, which is satisfied by this construction, which is the reality condition, which eliminates degrees of freedom, right? fixes uh, through this equality some uh, degrees of freedom. And then you can have a massive uh, particle described by this two-component uh, spinner, but now uh, on, you can only really write that if there is no charge for your uh, fermions. Right? So you have these three representations and it's clear uh, that they describe different physical situations. Now, before we go forward to the quantization of this theory, I want to take a look at how the classical solutions look. Right? Again, this is, this is fairly quick review because I'm assuming this is not the first time 
uh, you're seeing this. If you never saw uh, the, the solutions to Dirac equation, I, I, I think you should stop here and go take a, a, a deeper look in a book that does it properly and, and then come back to continue the, the video, right? So uh, the first thing to notice is that the Dirac operator, right? The operator that appears in Dirac equation, this one, right? This is the thing I'm applying to the Dirac field and that, that's equal to zero, right? If I multiply it for the adjoint operator, so it's just the complex conjugate of this, right? It's the one that acts on psi bar. If I write the Dirac equation for psi bar, this is the operator that appears. If I multiply both, I just calculate this. Right? What I get is the following. So let me just um, and I, I, this minus is the one that was here, so I can just write a plus here, and then I can use here a, a relation which we we'll use a lot. So let me derive it in general. If I have any uh, any vector, see, say v mu, vector in the sense of a Lorentz vector, and I, I contract it with gamma mu, then I get, I get v slash, that's what this, this notation means. But what I want to show is that if I calculate v slash, v slash, right, which is gamma mu, gamma nu, v mu, v mu, right? I cannot commutate uh, gamma mu and gamma nu, right? But v mu and v nu are just numbers, right? So they can, I can bring this v mu over here. And the point is, is I, is I, I can symmetrize this by noticing that I can just do half of gamma mu, gamma nu, v nu, v nu, plus gamma nu, gamma nu, v nu, v nu. I didn't do anything here, right? But since these indexes are all summed over, I can rename these in this way. Actually, mu, mu, right? It's just renamed uh, the indexes and I can, since these guys are just numbers, commute them huh? and rewrite this as half of the anti-commutator gamma nu gamma nu v nu v nu which then I know because this satisfies the Clifford algebra there's a two g mi nu here that conceals this half of side this is just g mi nu v nu v nu which is v square right so and that's true for any Lorentz vector right because I just use the properties of symmetry because these guys commute right so that's true also for the derivatives here so the term d slash d slash will be just uh, del square right del slash del slash will be just del square right so I can pretty easily Rewrite this as del square plus m square, um, acting on, on the same thing, right? That these guys were acting. Uh, and this is the Klein Gordon operator. This is the Klein Gordon equation. And, and of course, uh, this is true also for the other ordering. I could apply these operators in, like that. And that would be true too. This is important because it tells me that if I choose a field that satisfies this equation, that's Dirac equation, right? Written in terms of these operators, the same field will also satisfy Klein Gordon equation because I can just apply this to the left here and write. The operator, the Klein Gordon one acting on psi is also equal to zero. Right? And notice that now, since 
this guy, you see, I already contracted the gum, the Dirac matrices in a way that this is proportional to the identity in this four by four space that uh, the spinners living, right? In this four component spinner, this is just the identity. There's no gamma matrices here anymore. That means that each component of the of psi satisfies the Klein-Gordon equation. Same is true, obviously, to the adjoint uh, field, right? I think psi bar also satisfies this equation. I can apply the Dirac operator and you get also the Klein-Gordon equation. This is important because then I know the solutions. Right? We know the solutions to the Klein-Gordon equations are of the kind of some constant, right? Exponential of plus or minus i p x, where p here is the four momenta, right? Uh, satisfies the own shell condition, right? The relativistic dispersion relation. Remember, this is not vector p, this is the four momenta. Right? But in this case, the only difference is that now this constant in front needs to be uh, a four component object, right? It needs to be a more complicated thing than it was in the case of the scalar field, because now the field needs to be leaving this spin uh, space, right? And, and that's the main difference that we have to take uh, uh, care of. Off, right? So let's start focusing only on the positive frequency solutions, right? Again, we have two kinds of solutions. I'll define P0 bigger than zero, right? And uh, P square minus M square equals zero, right? And call the solutions that have uh, the minus sign here like that, psi so x. I'll call this coefficient in front u of p exponential of minus i p x. So I'm associating this u with the positive frequency solution, right? And in this case, I can get, right, this needs to satisfy the, the Dirac equation. So I can use the Dirac equation to convert the Dirac equation in a condition for this object, u here. Remember, this is the guy. Now, maybe, sometimes I, I can carry explicitly the Dirac indexes here, right? This is the guy that is carrying the four uh, component index in here. And I just have to replace this in Dirac equation to get this equation for you, right? easy to, to see, right? The derivatives will act here and, and take down powers of p mu. And again, p slash just means gamma mu, p mu. Hmm? Uh, and then I have to solve. If I solve this equation and find u, I have found a particular solution, right? And I have uh, solutions for every frequency, right? Uh, the way to do that is to go to a particular, the, most books do it like that, right? You go to a, a particular, the rest frame, right? And, and solve there and then apply a boost to get the general solution. I'm not doing this here. I'm just writing the solution, right? Uh, which is U of S P. This index I'll explain in a bit. Is the square root of P scalar sigma. Sigma there is Pauli matrices, right? In that generalized uh, way, right? Sigma is just one sigma i, right? It's a four component object and sigma bar is one minus sigma i. Right? So this is written in terms of sigma and sigma bar here. And there is this psi of s psi of s, right, which is, um, I'll, 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 I'll interpret it in a bit. Let me just put a box around this. And uh, right. this solution in the rest frame of, 
of um, P, right, taking the three moment at zero, right, is just U S that depends only on P zero because the other three are zero. And this becomes just the square root of M uh, psi of S psi of S, right? And, and of course, this guy, we know how, how rotations work on this, right? We also know how the spin operators act on these objects. Right? So these guys give the spin. I have to choose a spin basis. So suppose I take the Z direction, then the, the spin matrix will be the third poly matrix, right? And it's easy to see that I can have a basis just choosing Psi 1 like that, which will be the spin up in the direction of Z, or Psi 2 in the uh, spin down direction uh, for Psi. And I choose some normalization condition for Psi, right? which will be this one. Right, so this is the most general solution. And these there are two solutions because I have two spin orientations. And th those are two values of S. So S can be 1 or two, and in this case, I'm making the choice of one being the up in the z direction and two being down in the z direction, but there are more complicated choices that I could make. That's the basis for the orientation of spin. Also, if you don't remember this, be careful, right? This uh, is just p mu sigma mu, so it's the sum over uh, matrices, two by two matrices, so the square root of p sigma just means a matrix which if I take the square of that matrix, I'll get this, right? So it's the, square, the square root of matrices, that's what, what it means, right? Is, is the matrix, if I take square of that, I get that matrix, and I'll use that all the time. Hmm? It's easy to show also that if you take the rest frame, you go from here to, to there. So these are gene general solutions I'll use for the positive frequency part. The negative frequency is similar, right? I, I just name psi of x as vp exponential of plus ipx. So now I'm associating this solution, this other coefficient, I'm calling v when it's multiplying the, the positive uh, sign here, which is the negative frequency part. Right. Again, this will later set the properties. When I quantize this theory, these guys will become sort of creation and relation operators. So we'll have to take a look at that. Right. In this case, if I plug in this into Dirac equation, I'll get a different equation for V because of this changing sign here. I'll just get P slash plus M acting on V will be zero. Right? which means the general solutions are a little bit different. So Vs of P is equal to the square root of P sigma eta S minus P sigma bar eta of S. And these etas play, play the same role uh, that the Xi plays there, right? They, they establish a, ba a, a basis for the spin orientations, they satisfy the same, same condition. And when I choose a basis for these guys, uh, that implies in some basis for, for eta, right? As to satisfy a, a number of, uh, uh, normalization conditions, which I have down here, right? So these are the conditions I normally use when I have massive particles. When they are massless, I have a more appropriate one here, but they are equivalent for, for the case where there are masses. And this, these are a few consequences of the solutions written as above that I'll use uh, a lot, right? So there's some orthogonality properties here. The important thing to, to notice and keep in mind here 
is that I found a total of four independent uh, solutions, right? Two for, for, for two values of S for the positive frequency part and two for the negative frequency part. And that's what you expect since we already know that this rotates under 3D rotations, that it's spin half particles. You would expect for each uh, frequency to have two solutions because you can have two spin or independent spin orientations, right? So that's uh, so far consistent with spin half particle. Huh? So now the next step is to quantize this. So we know the, the classical solution. Let's go forward with the quantization. The first thing that you encounter if you, you go forward with the quantization Let's, let's talk about the canonical approach first. So I want to make my Poisson brackets into commutators, right? If I do that for the Dirac field and then impose commutation relations that are using just commutators, I will get to a situation where I get a Hamiltonian that has the possibility to have infinite uh, a number of levels with negative energy. Right? I won't show that here, that's shown on Pesky, and uh, you show in, in the exercise. I'll, I'll give that an, as an exercise. Right? In any case, we also expected, since we're hoping this is, uh, we'll describe spin half particles, we also expecting these uh, states uh, to satisfy some kind of firm, Fermi statistics, right? And that leads us to anti to, to instead of using commutators, instead of the Poisson, bracket, Poisson brackets, we use anti-commutators. And then I'll show that the Hamiltonian is, uh, is bounded from below. I mean, the, the spectra of energy is bounded from below. Right? So the first thing to do is to find the Hamiltonian and uh, the conjugate uh, momenta, right? The Lagrangian we wrote for these guys is the following. So when you del mu psi minus m psi bar psi, right? which I'll rewrite more explicitly in this way. I psi dagger gamma zero, gamma mu del mu psi, minus m psi dagger gamma zero psi. And this I can further simplify if I separate the time part from the space part here, right, which will give me i psi dagger gamma zero. Take the, the time part will be just gamma zero del zero psi plus i psi dagger gamma zero, and then the space part, gamma i del i psi minus m psi dagger gamma zero psi. This guy is just one, right? Gamma zero square is one, right? Which makes this whole, uh, t this whole term just i, psi dagger, and here I have just the time derivative, so this is psi dot. And this is convenient if we want to find the conjugate momenta, because we know that the conjugate momenta for psi is just del Lagrangian del psi dot, which is in this case just i psi dagger, right? So the conjugate momenta to psi is essentially psi dagger, uh, and you have this i in front. That means the Hamiltonian density will be p psi, psi dot, minus the Lagrangian, and that I can get easily, I right? will be pi, p psi, psi dot, minus, uh, I 
psi dagger by this term psi dot, which is the same as this because this is just pi of psi. Right? So these two conceal each other. And the rest of the Lagrangian, I just change the sign minus i psi dagger gamma zero gamma i del i psi plus m psi dagger gamma zero psi. Hmm? And that means my Hamiltonian is the integral d3x psi dagger minus i gamma zero gamma i del i plus m gamma zero psi, these two terms, right? Let me put a box around this, because we'll use it later. Now, if, as I said, I want to quantize this right, by imposing anti-commutation relation. So I'll write, do the same thing I would do with the commutators, but now with these anti-commutators. Right? And I'm using alpha here to indicate the index, uh, the spinor index, right? So alpha goes from one to four. And these are, again, now I'm just following the canonical approach, doing the same thing I did in the scalar case, the only difference being the anti-commutator. So I'm putting, imposing equal time uh, commutation relations. because we know that for different times we'll get to the propagators and, and, and that, that is coming down the line. And now, of course, I also have to care about these indexes, these new indexes that I have. And this is the relation I impose because the, the, that was already in the Poisson brackets of the theory. If you calculate the Poisson brackets, you see that. Right? And everything else, every other combination is zero. Right, so this is equal to this dagger dagger, which is zero. The most general solution for psi can be written in the following way. Right? And I and here I'm already following many of the discussions. I mean I'm following what I did for the scalar. Field. So we know from the discussion there that this is the appropriate normalization and you can check that same is true here, right? The general solution will be some coefficient that depends on the momenta times the exponential of minus ipx plus some other coefficient, right? Now this guy is an operator. These coefficients need to be operators too, right? ipx. And the main difference, this is very similar to what I had to for the scalar field. The main difference is that this guy now carries an index. Let me call that, uh, I don't know, i, that goes from 1 to 4, is the spinor index. And these guys carry that index too. Right? And I already know that each of these components satisfy, uh, satisfies the Klein-Gordon equation. So I have a fairly good chance that this will look like a harmonic oscillator, just like it happened in, in the scalar case. So what I want to do is to separate right, this uh, spinor behavior from what is the operator in here. So I'll parameterize these two coefficients in the following way. I'll take a, p uh, to be the sum over s, because in here I don't have these two uh, uh, I don't have S explicitly written here, right? This is the most general solution. As A, P of S, U, S, P, and then I, I have this index, right? I, which will be carried here. So now what, I, what I, am I saying here? This object will be the operator that I will use to satisfy this commutation relations, 
and I'm multiplying it by a function, right? Which is just the classical function that I show above, the classical solution, which carries the index i. That way I separate the space of spinors from these operators that if I hope, since this satisfies the klein gordon equation, will look like creation and annihilation operator, right? I'll do the same for B. So, I'll call this B of P will be the sum. And I'll call this guy B, I could call it A dagger, but we know that we have seen this before in the complex scalar field, right? I, I cannot call this A and A dagger because they won't have the proper commutation relation, right? Uh, eventually, I'll, I'll do the same for Psi bar, and Psi bar will have B and A dagger, right? Same as the, the, the complex scalar, but if you want, you can put A, B, C, and D, and in later check, which are the pairs of creation and annihilation operators. Also, I know that what comes together with this sign of the exponential is V and not U. And I want to keep this association here, right? As to not to mess things up. So I'm essentially writing this as the operator times the classical solution here. And with that uh, parameterization in mind, I can substitute here and write psi, right, which will take this form. Psi of x will be d3p over 2 pi to the cube, 1 over the square root of 2ep times the sum over spins a s u s p again i'm hiding these indexes but the spinor index is carried here and here exponential of minus i p x plus b s dagger of p v s of p exponential i Px, which then implies that psi bar, right, if I multiply, take the dagger and then multiply from the right by gamma zero, right, I get psi bar, the proper psi here, right, which will be very similar to this. So the whole normalization here is the same. I also have this sum over s, right? But I'll have b s of p v bar, right? Because I'll take the dagger. Remember, this is now a four component object. So uh, when I take the dagger, these guys also uh, become line uh, vectors, not columns, right? Uh, v s of p exponential of minus i p x plus a s dagger of p u bar s of p exponential of i p x right so compare this uh, uh, take the time to compare this with the complex scalar field right it's very similar Apart from these objects that carry the spinor index, this is almost identical to the complex scalar field. Right? And that means that when I take these two guys in this form and substitute here, right, I'll have to use the commutation, uh, the, the normalization conditions for u and v right, the, uh, that will eliminate a lot of the cross terms. But that implies, again, I'm not doing that calculation here, you can do it. But that implies commutation relations for, uh, for A, A dagger and B and B dagger, 
which will be again very similar to the complex scalar field but now with anti-commutators a p of r a dagger s say q i have to do that for different momenta right, is the same as b p again these guys depend only on vector b p r b q dagger s that's 2 pi to the cube delta 3 p minus q and a Kronecker delta for the spin indexes right and these uh, despite the anti-commutation anti relations is very similar to the bosonic case right you can define a, a fog space and you can show that the daggers increase are ladder operators in the fog space you can show that the the guys without the dagger are uh, uh, go down the ladder in the fog space and you can define the bottom step on the ladder as the vacuum by this condition right this defines the lowest lying uh, state just like that right and then any one excitation right which again will be interpreted as particles here will be some an object that now you have to specify momentum but also the value of s right and and uh, if i create these with a let's for now indicate like that right these will be this state a s dagger p acting on the vacuum right so i have to specify both the momenta and the orientation of spin of the excitation i created and i can also create an excitation with b which is a different excitation but the energy i'll show is is, is the same for same moment at same spin well, the main difference now the main difference is that now since instead of have uh, commutation relations between a and a dagger i have anti-commutation relation that implies i just have to substitute here right that implies that a p s dagger square right i just put the same operator twice here right this is zero right not here but uh you know a dagger a dagger is zero right that's the only anti-commutators that are different from zero so this one for any value of moment n s and r is always zero so if i put the same twice i get that relation and that same is true for b b p s dagger square right and that implies that if i i take uh and try to create two excitations with the same momenta and the same spin that will always be zero there's no two excitations in the same state which is what you expect from fermions right i also take the state and i'll have to define now it, that was not important for scalars but now i need to define an ordering here why because let let's suppose i have defined this ordering as this there's some normalization which i don't care about or some square roots and whatever right and i'm saying that this ordering here implies this ordering of the operators here suppose i'm creating the same spin but different momenta acting on zero so p k p k that is not the same as the opposite ordering because if these guys again satisfy a condition like that 
which means they anti-commute, so this is minus the same normalization. A, K, S dagger, A, P, S dagger, which then following my, my uh, notation there is minus K, S, semicolon, P, S, right? Which shows that these two particle states here are anti-symmetric under the exchange of particles, which again, very fermion-like. And that's, that's uh, all consequence, every, everything is a consequence of using anti-commutators at the start. But remember, this looks like a, a choice I'm making, but again, it comes from the representation by a very particular way. If I use the wrong commutation relations, I get a Hamiltonian that is not bounded. I mean, the spectra of the Hamiltonian will not be bounded from below. So infinite negative energies will be available if I use the wrong commutation relation. Right? So let's look at the Hamiltonian, right? I'm saying that now if I write the Hamiltonian, I just take all those uh, forms for psi and psi bar and I substitute up here, right? And rewrite the Hamiltonian. What I'll get is this. To remember this A is all only depend on the three. Which I can rewrite in this way. which is the normal ordered way, except for this term at the end here, B, P, dagger S, B, P, S. This last term, of course, is very badly behaved, right? It's, it's just a number and a, I mean, there's even a delta of P minus P here. And when I sum over and integrate over, this will blow up. This is the infinity, right? Uh, the vacuum energy, right? And we expect that that to show up. It also shows up in the scalar, in the harmonic oscillator. And, and we know this is eliminated by normal ordering, right? But we need to be a little bit careful here because what we meant by normal ordering in the case of scalars, right, it's just taking two, um, two um, operators like A dagger A, right, and I, I know that this is equal to this, right, minus the commutator of A dagger A, right, and normal ordering means I, I just invert this, ignoring this guy, right, you just ignore the commutator. But here, there was another effect when I move B dagger to the left of B. Right? I also got a sign. Right? This sign changed. That means that for fermions, we have uh, to redefine normal ordering. All I want to do with normal ordering is get rid of this infinity. Right? But I have to redefine normal ordering in a way that is consistent with the Fermi statistics I'm getting here. So for instance, you, you can see that if you think about products that are already normal order, take this one, right? 
This is already normal order, right? So it needs to be the same as this. But then again, if I take the opposite ordering, like this one, when I apply normal ordering, I don't want to matter how I'm ordering the guys in here, right? The normal ordering will be the final ordering. And, 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 and you know, this will be like this, right? QS rpr right which then i know if i commute these two guys and here i'm not throwing any commutator away i'm just exchanging the order of two guys that anti-commute i can see that this object is not the same as these right there's a sign difference between them so the normal ordering itself needs to be uh uh careful with, with when i commute fermionic operators so i'll redefine normal ordering in a consistent way so that the normal ordering of h on the first line here is the second line without these infinities and the definition i'll use is this one a r p a q s dagger is equal to minus a q s dagger a p of r right so that when i am forced to move uh, fermionic operators around to normal order i have to keep track of how many uh, steps i took over other fermionic operators to get to the normal ordering and i have a minus one to n steps on the left here right? i have to keep track of that so that i only get rid of the anti-commutator and not lose track of the fermionic character of this right of course these will have implications to Vick's theorem to fermions we'll see how that works when we get to Vick's theorem right? so this is all i wanted to say for today let me see if i i forgot anything uh, no so this is all all i wanted to say for today uh, we'll take a look on next video how the path integral quantization works for fermions and then we'll go forward to Feynman rules and, and, and get to the point where we can actually calculate uh, scatterings with fermions. See you then.